I know you and myself uh, 10 minutes for my questioning. And I'm gonna start by <clears throat> saying that it's been fascinating to listen to my Republican colleagues and to Speaker Gingrich um, when talking about the future of children in this country. And I think we can all stipulate that it would be great if everybody had a job that was well-paying and was that they were qualified for and that they enjoyed and that was convenient to do and that they could afford to work in. Um, it would be great if every child grew up in a stable family uh, with two parents, uh, whether they're male and male, male and female, or female and female. Uh, that would be a wonderful thing. And we can wish that that were the case, <clears throat> but it's sadly not the case throughout this country. And probably nothing that we could do in this body is going to change the fact that there are going to be millions of children, innocent children who did not choose the circumstances into which they were born, that will be suffering uh, with, if we don't act and somebody else doesn't act, they're gonna be suffering and diminishing their prospects for a future. And when I look at um, I have a three-year-old grandson. I have a one-month-old grandson. They're going to have every opportunity that they could possibly want. But they are typical. And when you look a generation or two into the future, the American tax base is going to be composed of a lot of children who come from very unfortunate circumstances, very unlucky circumstances. And that's really what we're talking about today. We're talking about those children, again, who don't choose the circumstances into which they were born, who are going to need some help from somewhere, whose families most frequently can't provide it, and who represent not just a challenge for our society and our government, but also a huge opportunity. Um, we're not going to convince people to uh, procreate more than they're doing now. As a matter of fact, I heard a news story today that because of the Dobbs decision that uh, the incidence of sterilization among women is dramatically rising. Uh, we Parents are choosing not to have children. So where is that tax base going to come from? We need to make sure that every child born in this country or who immigrates to this country has every opportunity to thrive. I want to give uh, Mr. Malik a an opportunity. I'm going to comment on some other things, but um, Mr. Grothman talked about uh, Head Start, a, a book his report on Head Start, and that seems to be the one report that has been brought up at least for the last 10 to 15 years to um, undermine efforts to have early childhood, universal early childhood education in the country. Would you care to comment on on that study and, and generally on the uh, the benefits of early childhood education? Yes, I'm, uh, I don't have in front of me the specific report that uh, Congressman Grothman was referring to. I do know that there was a Brookings AEI consensus report around uh, pre-K and early education, uh, including mentions of Head Start, um, that found you know, a wide range of benefits to children, to their families. It's important to note that um, Head Start doesn't just you know, provide educational services, but it, it promotes, uh, it decreases children's food insecurity, uh, promotes healthier eating habits and, and physical activity. Um, there are a variety of family services that are attached to Head Start that uh, also have tremendous benefits to the family. Um, so, uh, you know, there are also intergenerational benefits to Head Start. There are studies that have found that the children of Head Start recipients actually do better than those uh, of similar background, but whose parents weren't able to access Head Start. Thank you. One of the things, we all come to this job <clears throat> in this role with different experiences and from different, very different uh, areas. And I know many um, ranking members district is a lot different than my district. My district is 30 miles across. It is totally urban. Uh, we have one school system. It has almost 100,000 kids in it. In that school system, more than 50% of those schools are, our kids are on free or reduced lunch. 50% uh, of them at least change schools at least once during the school year because they've been shuffled around between uh, family members or they're homeless and so forth. And one of the things that was probably one of the most impactful things I heard 
once was I was at a luncheon on a Friday and I was sitting next to our school superintendent at the time. And they had just, it, it snowed, they had just called off school on Friday. And she said, you don't know how much it breaks my heart to have to cancel school on Friday because that's when kids get their blessings in a backpack. They take home their food and that will be all they eat all weekend. This is the type of situation for which WIC and SNAP is, are critical, don't you think, uh, Dr. Black? Yes, thank you, thank you. They, they certainly are critical. Yeah. And you know, I, I could go on at length about the American Rescue Plan and I, um, I've defended it a number of times before this committee. My name's on it as the author, um, even though I didn't write one word of it. Um, <laughs> But it came through our committee, so it says uh, Mr. Yarmouth on it, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. And, and I think we have to go back to that time, and because there's no question that there were incredible problems in the implementation of the American Rescue Plan. But what were we facing? We were facing a crisis that hit us almost spontaneously. Nobody saw it coming. All of a sudden, 20 million people are, people are out of work. Businesses are closing right and left. The, the economy basically shut down. We faced, unfortunately, blame it on whoever, going back a long time, uh, we were not prepared for a pandemic. So we're learning as we go along. You know, people who were justifiably critical but at, at the time, but the fact is we didn't know how bad it was gonna be. We, had, we shut down everything. We didn't know that kids were less vulnerable, more vulnerable. We, we knew that if they caught the disease, they would give it to their colleagues, their colleagues would take it home, and it would be disastrous. So when Mr. Gingrich says things like, we committed all this child abuse over the last two years, um, we did not commit child abuse. That's an absurd statement. Forgive me, Speaker Gingrich. Um, we were trying to do the best we could to maintain the safety and health of our kids and our families. And in my particular state, and the comments were, have been made about unemployment. And yeah, there was a lot of money that went to people who probably didn't <clears throat> uh, warrant it. In my state, unemployment applications went from about 200 a week to several thousand a week. That Department of Unemployment in Kentucky was not equipped to handle the deluge of unemployment applications that they were faced with. So yeah, they're trying to get money out the door. That's what we were all trying to do. We were, because we were facing an economy that was on the verge of collapse. So we were trying to get money to businesses. We were trying to get money to state and local governments. We were trying to shore up a sinking ship. And yeah, in those circumstances, which were unique, at least in my uh, lifetime, we were doing the best we could. And hopefully we'll learn lessons about that. And one thing I will agree with Speaker Gingrich on and some of my Republican colleagues, we rarely think about the implementation of the programs that we put into place. We need to be much better at that. And uh, you know, I, I stressed with the administration when we were trying to do the Build Back Better plan that, uh, and, and we're talking about childcare, that we can't just say we're gonna spend $300 billion on childcare unless we, think about how we're gonna build the capacity to do it. In my district, my, my school superintendent said, if, you, if we have universal pre-K for three and four year olds, something that I am passionately in favor of, that we would need to hire 400 new teachers and build two new schools. We're already 200 teachers short in our existing classrooms. Where are those teachers gonna come from? But meanwhile, we would hold out a promise to people who say, oh God, Next month, I'm going to get affordable childcare, and it just it wouldn't happen. So we need to be thinking about that much more. And so I think Speaker Gingrich might agree with me on that that point. Um, but you know, so much of this returns to what I see as a as a total difference in in perspective. That uh, some people believe that in kind of a Darwinian theory that everybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and uh, that's not our party. The Democratic Party believes government can be a force for good and, and that in a capitalistic society where there are invariably winners and losers that don't necessarily have anything to do with uh, who, 
who works harder or who tries harder. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about the late 1990s when there was the, the internet boom and the economy was sailing, but what that internet boom did was for the next 20 years made it impossible for a lot of people to find work because a lot of jobs disappeared because of it and continue to disappear and people are not prepared for that. So um, we can have great discussions about this, but the general economic situation, but I think what we're talking about today is how can we best ensure that the children of this country, the ones who, again, have no decision in, first of all, being born, and secondly, uh, how, the, how they're living, um, get the most support so that they can become productive members of society and have the kind of, of, of life that we want for our own kids and everybody else. So with that, uh, I'm going to yield back, but I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to ask for some things to be submitted into the record. Um, there's been some discussion today claiming that work requirements make children better off. In fact, CBO recently found that work requirements inflict unnecessary suffering and do little to actually boost employment or children's well-being. I ask unanimous consent to enter the report from CBO on work requirements into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, this hearing has also highlighted the various ways that more investments in children make them better off across the course of their lives. I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from the Children's Budget Coalition into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, we received a letter from over a thousand law enforcement officers highlighting how important, affordable, high quality child care and pre-K are to crime reduction. I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from Council for a Strong America into the record without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent to enter, enter a letter from Child Care Aware into the record uh, without objection, so ordered. So with that, uh, I thank the witnesses again for their responses. Thank you, Speaker Gingrich, for joining us remotely. And uh, without any further business, this hearing is adjourned.